gentlemen. Welcome to Dialysis SS Synergy 2020. I'm the master of the ceremony, Emma Lee. It's my pleasure to welcome you here and show you great appreciation for the presentation on the meeting while facing severe novel coronavirus. And thanks to COVID-19 give us a special chance to try a teleconference which we haven't tried before. Even if it's a brand new way, we hope you can enjoy the meeting and actively join the discussion. And for the first session, talking about right access for the right patient at a right time and for a right reason. I'd like to introduce you to our chair, Dr. Ke Bo Ren from Taiwan and two commentators, Dr. Yan Xu Ting from Taiwan and also Dr. Vikram Vijayang Sanasi from Singapore. Good morning, everybody, my dearest online audience. Good morning, everybody, my online uh, dearest audience. Um, welcome back to DAISY 2020 broadcast from Taiwan. I am Dr. Po Jen Ko, the president of TAVH. Taiwan Association of Vascular and Access Health. I'm pretty happy to be here to hold this conference, although in this viral uh, epidemic uh, duration, but we, however, we have converted to a teleconference in a very short period of time. Before today's session, I want to report to all of you, announce proudly that um, we, yesterday's session in the afternoon, uh, according to the data, actually, we have more than 7,000 uh, traffic's online audience. Um, among them, more than 6,000 of them are from uh, the WeChat platform and other 1,000 or 2,000 from the YouTube uh, platform. I think this is quite amazing. As a conference, if it's an, in, a, in reality, actually, if you can get uh, several hundreds or over 1,000, that's quite big. Uh, so I think this is a big step for all kind of medical conference. Maybe in the future, this is we can put into consideration when uh, during a uh, special uh, moment. Okay, today we are going to start our Daisy 2020 with a very meaningful section regarding how to provide optimal care for our patient, how to put uh, patient on our consideration. Uh, our topic will be how uh, right access for the right patient in the right time and for the right reason. Um, we have our uh, distinguished panelists online now, I believe. Uh, my co-chair, co uh, one of our commentator, Yan Xu Ting, is online now from southern Taiwan. Uh, Dr. Yan, how are you in southern Taiwan? Uh, everything is so Everything is fine. Everything For me fine. right now, the clinical practice do not have any inputs. All right, that's very good. Uh, uh, here in Northern Taipei, our weather is a little bit raining, uh, but the uh, temperature cloud is quite uh, comfortable. Yes. Yeah, so in the beautiful Saturday morning, we are going to proceed with our our session on the uh, right strategy for the right patient. How do you look at this topic uh, from your uh, point of view. Are you, do you think that our strategy currently should be changed uh, for somehow for our vascular access management? Dr. Yan. Dr. Yan. Hi. How, how do you look at, uh, do we need a new guideline or some revision on our principle to manage our patient? Uh, I think because the medical practice is more and more better, so I think we should update our practice guideline. And uh, Right now, for my clinical practice right now, it's very different from the 10 years ago, like in, in my federal. So I think there are many new devices available in Taiwan. For example, like the currency is now available in our institute. So the interest of clinical practice in the 
patient will need the IVG, we will shift, gradually shift to the uh, quick uh, early puncture graft to make, uh, to lower the in percentage of case the in implant. Yes, Dr. Yen had mentioned the change in not only devices, but also procedures in our daily practice. So apparently, constant change in everything is mandatory. So that's why we are going to introduce today's uh, topics. We have very uh, big, uh, very good distinguished speakers today, including uh, speakers from Canada, Japan, and Singapore, and so on. Uh, so uh, can you see our uh, from the multi view? So uh, today we have uh, speakers from everywhere so talking about, yeah, you can see on screen. Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome. Yeah, you are all online. So, Sharman, great talk. And you have another set of slides to present, right? Or? Uh, I, don't, I don't have it here. I'm going to yeah. be presenting uh, at 3 in the morning. It's okay. Yeah, so uh, later on, we are going straight into the discussion of the new guideline. Okay, thank you. Okay. So sure. we'll have you back later on. And so I think our next speaker will be from Japan, right? Uh, uh, Paul, can, can we have a quick discussion? Oh, you want to uh, discuss on the new guideline but, first? Yeah. Uh, before we yes. run into yeah. while, uh, while everyone uh, yeah yes I, that's I'm good. sure everyone in their mind they have a, like a lot dozen of questions yeah that's well, right that's we, right so for me myself we... I will start from that uh, it takes like 4.5 years to get a new guideline be ready it's, you know, it must have a lot of work so my question would be that we have to do constant change improvement on all kinds of clinical management so if we want to have want to have a new guideline, so I was wondering if the team is preparing for the next guideline from now. Otherwise, we'll have another guideline for the next twenty years. Uh, yes, you know I'll tell you this was probably the most challenging thing I have done in my career. Um, these guidelines were a tremendous, tremendous amount of work, and I think it took so long because it, there was such a long time between guidelines. So there's pros and cons about that. So the downside is it took so long. The upside is that it had time to accumulate evidence. So I think that it is too long to wait. And there is evidence as to how often guidelines should come out. And that should be actually every four years. So I can tell you we missed, you know, while we were developing it, there's more evidence. So I can tell you that we we're actually doing a collaboration um, with another society and we are already in the works of already updating these guidelines. So it is actually already ongoing. So you make a very excellent point um, in terms of the workload and being on, up to date. I think it is much better to be more uh, frequent in, in when we can provide new guidelines. Thank you. Uh, so can we see the uh, faculty multi view? So later on, yes, I can see if you want to sp uh, say something, raise your hand. I'll, I see it swinging. Yes. Yes, you have something to say, right? Uh, um, just a couple of things, Charmaine. I think the rule of six is it's really, I think it's a very useful rule, but it's not, it's not a law, it's a protocol. Like for instance, I've always said that rule of six is in terms of depth and size is fine. If you've got a 3.5 millimeter fissure that's one millimeter under the surface, that's fine, you can access that. Absolutely. If you've got yep. a one centimeter fistula that's eight millimeters deep, you can also access that. So the rule of sixes has to be used in a very flexible manner. The other point I wanted to make is the surveillance monitoring. People s separate those two terms and scientifically you're correct. But I think the basic message is you have to look after all your fistulas. Whether you do that with a patient self-examining on home dialysis or read your ultrasounds, you know, it's got to be adapted and modified for each patient. But all fistulas should be looked after regularly. Absolutely. So let me comment on the first one. The rule of sixes, I agree with you 100%. It is a good guideline. The problem is um, 
not everybody just uses that as a guideline. They use it as um, they must reach all of these rules of sixes. So the point that we were trying to make is that if you are very rigorous and just follow that, it doesn't work. You know, we, we showed that, you know, for most specialists to work based on those studies that, you know, a depth of six millimeters may be too deep. So you have to use your own clinical judgment. So that's really the main concept. And we agree with you 100% about every single access, every fistula, every graft, every catheter has to be looked at every dialysis to your point. And that's why we say monitoring is primary. Surveillance is when you use machines like transonic machines and other machines that you can't do every dialysis. That is, you know, on a regular basis, it depends on the skill of the operator. There's a lot of variables. So that's why we can't make it primary. It has to be secondary. We agree with you 100% that that access needs to be looked at every single dialysis. And that is actually also in the guidelines. Yeah, faculty, raise your hand if you want to comment or question. Oh, or Jackie. I think Dr. Liu said something. Um, maybe NC first. NC. Can you hear NC? me? Can you yeah. hear me? Yes, I can see you. Okay, great. Can you hear me? I can. Fantastic. Now, Shamin, congratulations uh, for publishing this guideline. Thank you. I, I like the concept of a lifetime plan. However, <laughs> how are you going to communicate to the patient and also to the other healthcare facility? Now, if yeah. you have a patient that actually comes to only one healthcare system, it's very easy because everything is charted and everyone understands the health, the lifetime plan. Mm -hmm. However, the patient hops from one center to the other center, sometimes yeah. what you wanted for the patient may not be realized by the other, you know, co- uh, you know, practitioner, so that becomes difficult. So right. what's your strategy? Right. So, so I just want to make it clear, the life plan is about what kind of modality that they're going to have. So hemodialysis followed by peritoneal dialysis, for example. So obviously the patient themselves needs to know because they're the one that's going to be receiving that kidney replacement therapy, be it a transplant or PD or hemodialysis. So they will know. Um, and then following that, their vascular access, that's, an, that's another issue that follows the life plan. So the implementation committee is working on, you know, how can we do this? And, and we've had some ideas, like obviously good communication, the patient should themselves know, um, you know, one of the things that we're thinking of is developing a, a mobile app. Almost everybody now has a phone where this can be communicated or it should be followed by their chart. Um, and actually in the guidelines, there's a, a template of how you can actually uh, create a life plan and communicate with um, providers in terms of what their dialysis access may be. But I agree with you, it is challenging. It, it's a more comprehensive approach, um, but it needs more coordinated care. And that's really what we want for our patients. We want a, a team approach uh, to manage our patients. Um, so it, it will take some, you know, good communication and it puts more of the responsibility on, on the patient in terms of, they should know if they're gonna have PD or hemo or transplant and what that order is. So you're right. I think we just need to work on that in a more sophisticated way. Thank you. Uh, Shamay, uh, so yes, again, uh, congratulations. I think the publication of this, uh, uh, new Kato Key as a formal one is really a, a gift to Daisy as well. So very happy. Yeah. So I, I have two questions. One is like more limited to the uh, cannulation, the rule of six, where uh, John has uh, mentioned that it is very important that people understand it's a relative combined factors of size and uh, death and maybe even also on the tortuosity and everything. Um, but I am a little bit worried when there is no a reference number for the vast uh, number of people who are doing cannulation and every country, every places is different. There could mm -hmm. be 
sometimes uh, uh, too premature use or too delayed usage of the fistula where uh, uh, the practice would be uh, even more difficult to uh, uh, monitor or, or, or uh, advise on. The, the second thing is about the plan uh, where in your uh, recommendation, you, you do have mentioned about that the plan has to be changed when the patient's condition change as well. But again, I, I will be actually a bit worried that in the real practice, in the real world practice, uh, for very diligent or very well communicated team, they will change this plan from time to time. However, in, in a system that it is not so well developed, uh, this part may not be able to perform. And so some of the patient, they might stick onto a wrong plan, even the situation change or body condition change. Thank Great. you. So I think those are very excellent points. Um, so the first one with regards to cannulation, I mean, having a rule that doesn't work can cause more harm than good. So it's better not to have something that it, that can, you know, put us back. So there's a lot of things when you look at the guidelines that, um, you know, there really is no good evidence and we make research recommendations. So we know that um, in, in several studies that um, a good nurse or technician that can cannulate knows 80% of the time, so better than the rule of sixes, when it officially can be cannulated. So again, to Dr. Sweeney's point, it's that excellent physical examination, looking at that access, becoming familiar with it. And that's why the first recommendation is to have more training with regards to vascular access so they can know, you know when to be able to cannulate. So you're right, there needs to be more research and, and experience with regards to cannulation. And that's an issue uh, that has been longstanding. So rather than, uh, ignoring it and putting on the rule of sixes, we really should uh, invest uh, energies in, in determining when should we actually cannulate. Your second question about the life plan, I agree with you. So, you know, we see patients who are on hemodialysis, they deteriorate, they deteriorate, and oftentimes the plan is maybe they should stop dialysis, you know, and that is often not looked at. Or a patient who is having a failing PD you know, you, you know patients who leave transplant and peritoneal dialysis, they are constantly starting hemodialysis with a central venous catheter, uh, which is really um, suboptimal. So when we say regularly review when there's a change, so that if a patient is having technique failure with PD or their transplant is failing, that you can actually consider putting in the appropriate fistula or access before that transition. And that actually falls on the nephrologist. So the life plan, you know, when we say it needs to be regularly updated, actually falls on the responsibility of the nephrologist. And that nephrologist really needs to communicate with the rest of the team uh, in terms of the change in their modality and what the implications are for dialysis access. Thank you, Sharman. So allow me to move forward to next speaker, and then we may have time to discuss later on. For the next speaker, let's welcome Dr. Akira Miyata from Japan, sharing about the pathway dialysis SS specialist had gone through in Japan. Dear colleagues, my name is Akira Miyata, and I'm working for the Japanese Red Cross Kumamoto Hospital as a vascular surgeon. My specialty is surgical creation and repair of dialysis access and the inter interventional treatment of vascular access. Today, I will present you the pathway in which we Japanese doctors went through in these decades in the field of vascular access. What I'm going to talk about is what really happened in Japan. I don't think the same thing happened in your countries because the healthcare system is quite different in each country. But about 30 years ago, when I started treating vascular access as a vascular surgeon, 
There has been very tough event in Japan for several years. Once upon a time, when there was no interventional treatment in Japan, the clinical department in charge of vascular access differed by regions in Japan. For example, in one prefecture, it was urology, in some, surgery, and in another, vascular surgery. Thus, in one area, only one department could perform surgery to create vascular access, while others were not allowed to do it. Although it may be a special case only in Japan, it is possible to perform vascular access creation surgery and interventional treatment without a special qualification. So, when interventional treatment was introduced to Japan, specialists from multiple disciplines entered this interesting field. But which specialists are best suited for vascular access? Nephrologist, cardiologist, radiologist, or urologist? For this reason, there were intense exchange of opinions between specialists. The conference had sometimes a severe disagreement regarding repair and the treatment of vascular access, whether interventional treatment is better or surgical repair is better. But if you think about it, nephrologists are not originally trained in surgery, and the surgeons and the urologists are likely to be less skilled in, in, in the vascular treatment than radiologist and cardiologist. In addition, cardiologists and radiologists are not familiar with dialysis and are not familiar with how vascular access is used. Eventually, a study group was established in which nephrologists and neurologists jointly discussed together about vascular access. Almost at the same time, a study group consisting of specialists in many fields and specialized in interventional treatment for vascular access was established. These doctors are leaders in leading and coordinating the field of early Japanese vascular access. The two doctors on the left have already passed away but have left a very important legacy of mutual understanding and cooperation among specialists. As a result, the Japanese Society for Dialysis Therapy established the Guideline Committee for Vascular Access, composed of experts in different fields and published the first guideline in 2005. The different color in, a, in the author's names represent surgery, urology, nephrology, radiology, etc. In 2011, we updated the guidelines to make it more practical. In 2014, a workshop for young doctors involved in vascular access started by the Japanese Society for Dialysis Access. Trainees are nephrologists, urologists, surgeons, etc., and uh, instructors uh, are specialists in uh, various fields to teach basic knowledge and the techniques from the creation to restoration of, of vascular access. This figure shows the relationship between patient and the doctors up to creation and the repair of vascular access, which is published 
in the vascular access guideline of the Japanese Society for Dialysis Therapy. The important point of this figure is that in Japan, the skill of creating and restoring vascular access is evaluated not by the department, but by the skill itself of each physician. And in the last decade, new players around dialysis patients have emerged in Japan. They are specialized nurses and clinical engineers who specialized in extracorporeal circulation shown with orange color in this slide. This slide shows a medical round at a clinic. In addition to doctor, nurses, clinical engineer, nutritionist, and financial clerk surround the patient, present the data to the patient, and the plan treatment with the patient. In this way, in Japan, we are now trying to provide a harmonized medical care by multidisciplinary specialist for dialysis patient. Thank you for your attention and a special thanks for your support and help after Kumamoto earthquake in 2016. Thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you, Dr. Miyada. You have told us a Morning, story every which appreciate is which is very, very uh, inspirational uh, regarding multidisciplinary cooperation. So any comment from our faculty? I think this is fantastic. Uh, you see uh, in Japan happened uh, different specialists work together for guideline, which is quite, I think is very good for the, pa the patient. Yes, Jackie. Prof. Uh, Miata, yeah, thank you very much for the, the excellent talk about the pathway that uh, Japan has gone through. Uh, in, in a lot of uh, other countries, uh, there is also this accreditation issues. Uh, that means uh, different uh, specialists, uh, maybe they are like through the training, through their daily practice, they're already doing a certain procedure or, or doing certain uh, operations. But uh, now there is always a concern about accreditation uh, to allow um, people with a specific experience uh, uh, legitimated to do a specific procedure. So how is it uh, being rolled out in or practice in Japan? Yes, um, as I said in the slides, uh, we have uh, no special qualification uh, for treating uh, for treating a pa uh, CKD patient, HD patient. So that uh, we need uh, we need to create some a kind of a kind of uh, um, training system in our in our in each uh, specialty, for example, in a, in a urologist or in a, a, a cardiologist or, or uh, in a, in a fee, uh, congress of, uh, of, uh, of a nephrologist. I mean, but uh, there, was, there, was, there was a big difference among those uh, specialists. So that uh, we finally, uh, we decided uh, to make uh, create uh, one form to uh, train uh, uh, the doctors who are uh, who are going to dedicate to the AV history of, uh, AV access. So um, Japanese Society of uh, uh, Dialysis Access uh, once a year. Uh, get together and uh, all the specialists 
who can be a trainer uh, get together and then train the trainees. Uh, the number of the, those trainees are almost at 20 uh, to 30, not so, not, not such a big number, but uh, uh, every year we uh, try to uh, try to teach them from the um, from the uh, how how to create uh, create a vascular access AV fistula to uh, graft or how to do uh, intervention by using an, an a pig. Uh, this could be um, let's say uh, somehow functioning not. Uh, it is not a uh, very good way, but uh, uh, this is what we are going to, uh, we are doing now. Um, Jackie? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Miata. So now we are going to proceed to next talk. Okay. For the next speaker, let's welcome Dr. Jackie Ho from Singapore. Her topic is functional success of AVF, whole process review. Good morning, everyone. Appreciate the extraordinary efforts of the organizing committee to allow us gather here online to continue to discuss the matter close to our heart, dialysis access. Native vein fistula still being regarded as one of the best modality of access for many kidney failure individuals. However, the clinical outcome functional success of every fistula can be quite disappointing. Here are two big studies published in year 2018. One reported more than 45,000 AVF created within a year in US and only about half of them are ever being used within four months. Another study DOPS show huge discrepancy across the world in terms of the utilization of distal upper limb AV fistula and its success rate. Here is the beginning of the process on the left hand side where nephrologists consider patient having a need for dialysis immediately or in the near future. And on the right side is the end where we can eliminate the need of a central venous catheter or remove it. Many people think that this part is the main reason for the discrepancy. Surgeon evaluate the patient, make clinical decision and carry out the surgery. Studies have been done extensively to review the inference of vessel size, vessel quality, patient demographics, access decision, surgeons, surgical skill, etc. on fistula success rate. All these do affect success rate. But this part cannot account for all the discrepancies we observed. After the creation, fistula maturation can be a wide spectrum of condition. On one end, it can be very fast, very good maturation and cannulation super easy. On the other spectrum, it can be thrombosis soon after the surgery. Well, in between, there are some fistula matured slightly slower, not too obvious, uneven diameter or deeper situated or tortuous in its course. Successful cannulation may not be so straightforward. There could also be intimal hyperplasia developed in the inflow segment few weeks after the creation. Those AVFs will need various assisted procedures to make cannulation steady. In the whole process of creating a fistula and making it functionally successful, many different discipline specialists physically likely not in the same location and might not even know all the names and faces within the team have to work together with the patient to get the ultimate goal successful. I would say it is not easy at all. With that in mind, we want to study in detail the whole process of this fistula maturation and successful cannulation. Within the whole hospital, two of the nephrologists, myself and a nurse specialist, rather focus on access performance, work close together so 
we will review the patient being taken care under this small team only. The role of nephrologist, vascular surgeon, and nurse specialists have some overlap and some unique aspects. All of us do post-op maturation assessment and cannulation planning. Nephrologist has more role in decision to initiate access creation and maturation intervention. I have more role in surgical decision, actual surgery, decision of secondary maturation procedure and carry out the procedures, as well as doing ultrasound guided fistula cannulation for challenging cases. The nurse specialist, beside reviewing the patient post-op and support fistula cannulation in hospital, more importantly, she forms a bridge between the clinician in the hospital, the dialysis nurses in the community, and the patients. She will convey information of where to cannulate to the dialysis nurse and feedback on what was the challenges encountered. After fistula creation, all patients will be reviewed within two weeks for wound and flow, then every three to six weeks for maturation. Secondary procedure to assist maturation will be offered if poor maturation features was detected. The team will bring the patient with less ideal fistula in to do ultrasound guided cannulation for one to two times. The ultrasound assessment enables us to pick up the most favorable site for cannulation. Then the needle marks can be followed by the community dialysis nurse afterwards. Once the cannulation is steady and the patient is confident to go without catheter, removal of the catheter will be arranged. The study includes patients from January 2015 to October 2017. Last day of data entry was 31st October 2018. So each patient at least have one year of follow-up. We define functional success of fistula for preemptive cases as the clinician decided clinically and also ultrasound criteria of the fistula is ready for cannulation. For incidence patient with a tunnel catheter in situ, the success is only counted when the tunnel catheter is being removed. This is because sometimes even cannulation started, it may not be every time smooth and steady. So patient may still depend on the tunnel catheter from time to time. During the study period, a total of 137 fistulas were created for 129 patients, mean age 63, and majority with hypertension and diabetes. About a quarter of the fistula was created for preemptive use. The rest are for incidence patients. 40% is first-time fistula creation. About 26% is the first fistula created on the opposite upper limb. And 7.3% is a secondary fistula over the same upper limb after the previous one failed. Eight patients subsequently underwent transplantation, converted to PD, and some lost follow-up. 26 patients required various modality of secondary procedure, including endovascular and open surgery. And among them, another five patients required fistula plasty again for maturation. Overall, by end of the study, five fistula failed and required another HD creation, HD access creation, and four still not matured. We look closer into each segment of the process. It took an average of 97 days, ranging from 1 to 243 days, to do various secondary and tertiary procedures to rectify problems and assist maturation. From creation to ready for cannulation, on average, it took about 89 days. This includes straightforward maturation as well as those with problems that require assisted procedure. Then from cannulation to removal of tunnel catheter, on average, it took 55 days. 
In our opinion, these are the challenges encountered for each segment of the whole process. After the fistula creation, challenge of having an early secondary procedure for assist maturation include the question to act or not to act imposed for the clinician. Of course, sometimes patients' resistance or disappearance might also delay the process. Many a time, the fistula may not dilate at the same rate over the whole course. It is not practical for clinicians to expect very ideal fistula with big and long length of cannulation zone every time. Clinicians need to assess meticulously the whole course of the fistula to see any good segment suitable for cannulation. Fistula cannulation is a challenging task. Cannulation planning is very important. The one who do this planning must have good understanding about the cannulation process as well as its challenges. Cannulation skill of dialysis nurse certainly makes a difference. Patients' vessel and soft tissue quality and their cooperation will affect the success of cannulation. In the hospital and clinic, we have ultrasound to understand the fistula better whereas in the dialysis center, ultrasound is not available. Clinical evaluation is the only method. Sharing of ultrasound finding, images, and also schematic diagram of fistula with the dialysis nurse help facilitate cannulation. Here is the functional success rate of our cohort. Based on anatomical type of fistula, RCAVF, have a significantly lower functional success rate than more proximal AVF at three months time period. This difference was no more observed by six months and longer period. So in patients that require an earlier catheter removal, a more proximal fistula might be the preferred one. Whereas when we look at the nature of the fistula, preemptive seems to have a good success rate, probably partially because it doesn't count into the time between commencement of cannulation to removal of tunnel catheter. There isn't a period to test out the fistula before determining its success. For incident dialysis patients, majority still not ready to get rid of the tunnel catheter within three months. We need to work more to see how we can speed up the process. On the other hand, secondary AV fistula seem to work very well and matured fast. If possible, we should consider using this kind of fistula more. I hope our study had illustrated the complex process of an AV fistula from creation to functional success, involving various specialists in different work locations. We need to examine each segment of the whole process carefully to identify where is the holding up? Our results indicate there are still rooms for improvement. And I believe for all of us working on dialysis access, we must invest on a harmonized, structural, concert, concerted effort team to provide the service in order to give a good outcome. Thank you very much. Excellent. Excellent. Experience sharing, excellent experience sharing from Jackie Ho. Uh, can I ask a question? Uh, does the study result of your uh, experience change your clinical practice in the future? I think uh, there are a few things that we want to do in the future. Number one, we should have a more structural uh, uh, tracing up of our progress. So we are planning to roll out a, a system where uh, a, 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 a non-clinical staff is going to trace us, like if the patients, uh, whether they are matured by uh, six weeks and eight weeks, whether the tunnel cavity or, or the needling has started by eight weeks or not. So we will constantly receive reminder to uh, uh, trace what is the progress so that our clinical decision can be uh, uh, taken into account of the time frame. Uh, that is one thing. And the other thing is probably, I think we should be a little bit even more aggressive uh, in 
uh, rolling out the uh, assisted procedure for maturation. And then, of course, the, the third thing is, I, I think we should uh, have even more study on the uh, cannulation uh, uh, side of the uh, process. I, I think right now, we don't have much uh, uh, systematic data to know like uh, how uh, successful or unsuccessful, how easy and what is the challenge. So I, I, I fully agree with what Shaming uh, uh, previously uh, mentioned that we, we need to have more study on this aspect. Yeah. That's right. So uh, I think I urge every clinician to look into the process of the clinical practice and see where the problem is, where can improve and try to improve it step by step for everybody. So. Uh, now, we are going to uh, proceed to the next topic to share the different situation in his country uh, about how to improve the patient care for dialysis access management. For our next speaker, let's welcome Dr. Ke Boren from Taiwan, sharing about how does he practice for hours for Taiwanese patients who need dialysis. How do I practice uh, in Taiwan, ta sharing of Taiwan experience? The concept is in consistent change to improve the patient care. So now we focus and do the right things, uh, the right access for the right patient, the right time with the right reason. Start from some case illustration. Uh, this case is uh, a very simple case, but uh, actually a lot of thought in that case. Uh, Mr. A, 55 years old, made uh, chronic renal failure, follow up at nephrology here in Taiwan and refer from for arm access creation because of the renal function deterioration with the comorbidity of DM and hypertension. So we start from, of course, physical examination here in Taiwan for every patient. That is must. Uh, brachial pulsation is essential because arterial is important and vascular echo uh, we know from the newest guideline shaman had told us not everybody we do the echo but actually echo is not harmful so we do the vascular echo screen through or vasculature which may be um, needed in construction of the access bilateral we found that bilateral exhausted superficial vein and the cephalic veins are exhausted which is quite common in some patients with a lot of committed comorbidities, and we found a sizable uh, upper arm basidic vein is possible, and the radial arteries, battery is calcified, so, so this is what we made, we, because uh, in consideration of his age, we think that we have, give him, have to give him a durable relatively durable access, so we decided to do left side basilic superficialization. The gentleman is right-handed, uh, considered the uh, uh, life quality of his future life during dialysis, so do the left hand. Uh, we did the operation in a stage fashion. Second case, Miss B, 40-year-old maid, admitted uh, from the ER for emergent dialysis, which is quite common. Also, awareness in Taiwan is uh, we urge everybody to look at the renal function, follow up the renal function at the nephrology department. But however, a lot of cases come through the ER for dialysis urgently. Using femoral double volume, of course, in the emergency department, nephrology put in uh, the catheter for emergent dialysis and then refer to a surgical department for the access creation with the comorbidity of DM. And during the physical examination, the positive bilateral radial pulsation found, the vascular echo found that bilateral forearm superficial vein around only one or 1.5 millimeter, not so big, uh, bilateral internal jugular vein was intact because of no catheter history. So what, they have, what we have done is since a, a temporary catheter has been placed on the inguinal, first we do a tunnel cuff catheter via right internal jugular vein and to buy some time for future fissure maturation uh, considering the life expectancy of the lady. We 
or want to do a radiocephalic fissure creation. And although the vein is not so big, but if it's non matured or not satisfactory in maturation process, we'll go for voluminous maturation. And the third case is quite, um, is relatively young, 23 year old female. And um, of course, for her age, uh, cosmet cosmet cosmetic concern is uh, quite significant. So she cares about the uh, body image and what she looks like. She doesn't want to uh, let everybody know that they, she will be put on dialysis or a fissure on uh, her hand. So uh, during the visiting, uh, she had denied any fissure on forearm, which made, uh, made it impossible to wear some beautiful dress to, to show her hands. Uh, at the same time, she's waiting for a renal transplant. So for the physical examination uh, and vascular echo, we found a positive cephalic vein over uh, the upper arm and forearm as well. But after a long discussion, a thorough discussion, we have discussed the pros and cons of the radiocephalic uh, creations. But eventually, we come up with the decision made uh, with, uh, after discussion with the patient, we had made a decision to to do a left elbow brachiocephalic fissure creation. So, which is uh, quite, uh, stay away from our uh, usually consensus of radiocephalic first. Uh, some brief introduction of the condition in Taiwan. The reimbursement is quite uh, in significant, a uh, very significant difference from uh, some of other countries. In our country, in Taiwan, we have nearly 100% coverage of population by the healthcare reimbursement. The healthcare reimbursement covers the dialysis patient as well, uh, including access creation, revision, and intervention procedures, including those uh, device, balloon, wire, stand graft, catheter, graft, surgical graft, and so on. No coinsurance has been paid, so actually it's quite generous for our dialysis patients. The care of dialysis patients in Taiwan is given by uh, multidisciplinary specialist. Uh, the main part of medical, medical medication and dialysis therapy was given by nephrologists. Nephrology, they are responsible for follow up the medical condition of those that are dialysis patients and also provide a dialysis service. Actually, more than 60% of 70% of dialysis service in Taiwan are provided clinics on the street set up by nephrologists. And for vascular surgeon, we do access creation, we do maintenance intervention as well. And among those vascular surgeons, some of the, uh, some of the access are created by urologists and plastic surgeons in Taiwan, although minority, but still a few uh, urologists or uh, plastic surgeon doing excess creation in Taiwan in some area. And cardiology and intervention radiologists play a role in the uh, maintenance of the AV access in Taiwan as well. They do endovascular treatment, but not the excess creation or surgical procedures. The excess creation, uh, nephrologists can uh, they decide the patient selection. And because of the total coverage of reimbursement, the nephrologist send the patient, refer the patient when they think it's necessary to the vascular surgeon they know. And vascular surgeon will do the rest of the work, including planning. Uh, physical examination is uh, very important. Preoperative echo mapping is uh, becoming uh, more popular in recent years. I would say that I think more than 70%, 80% of patients went through echo mapping before the procedure and then they are sent on uh, operation. As for access maintenance, the nephrology, they do of course monitor. During the dialysis session, the nurses of dialysis center, they do the phys physical examination every time. And surveillance, and some dialysis center, they do surveillance uh, to take the flow uh, probably every three months or four months. Uh, surgeons, uh, we do monitors uh, we do surveillance, we do intervention, we do revision if necessary. So some, a bunch of patients, uh, we will arrange regular follow-up in surgeon's clinic 
to do physical examination and uh, echo examination in our clinic visiting. And cardiologists and intervention interventionists, and when necessary, some nephrology will send the patient to uh, the cardiology for intervention. As for best timing, um, early referral to access surgery is very, very important. The concept has been implemented to almost every nephrology, but however, the biggest hurdle is the patient's concept. Still, uh, I think uh, patient awareness is very important regarding the uh, uh, creation of the AV access. Uh, in Taiwan, actually, there are very close relationship with, with, uh, between dialysis centers and the access surgeon interventionist. Every dialysis center actually have their own connection to, to the preferred surgeon or interventionist to do access maintenance work. So they do uh, the works in very good co cooperation. So for the right reason, of course, we do the access for prepare for dialysis or the patient uh, need long-term hemodialysis or when sometimes the nephrologist decided when the patient need a bridge to further replacement therapy such as transplantation or PD, then we ask the surgeon will call upon for uh, access creation. Uh, for the principles of, of uh, creation of access, we have several weapons at hand, catheter, but of course uh, most of our physician, we think catheter last it is a very important principle. Uh, we prefer tunnel cuff catheter rather than temp catheters, uh, even if the duration of a catheter implantation is within one month, we, we, will, we like tunnel cuff catheters. And fissura, most of us start from RC and BC, and some of them superficialization and BEM, especially for real, relatively young patient, we need a fissura. We think fissura is better than graft. And the graft, now we have early puncture graft and hero graft at hand. For selective patient, this might be a good way to consider. Patient first, I think this is very important. Recent years, actually, we listen more and more to our patient, not only order them, but discuss with them. Uh, consider the age, gender, comorbidity, and life expectancy. Every patient is different. Anatomy, of course, is important. Um, a lot of things, uh, especially the willingness of the patient, it is uh, much neglected in the past. Now we care more and more about patient's willingness. And of course, after the creation, the accessibility to medical service of patient is very important. For example, a patient lives far from the medical service provider or near the medical service provider uh, face different situation. We may uh, have to come up with different plan of treatment. So in short, uh, in conclusion, in Taiwan, we do total coverage of health insurance. That's very lucky for our patient. We do joint effort of different specialties. Uh, that's good for our patient. And so we do the right things for our patient. Thank you. So we are moving forward to the next uh, speaker to share his experience on dialysis access care. For the next speaker, let's welcome Dr. Jen Jones Winnan from Australia, sharing how does he practice for hours for Australian patients who need dialysis. Okay, so you need your online now. Hello? Oh, yes, I'm here. Yeah, please proceed on your talk. Have you got my talk up? So your slide? Share screen. Share screen, share your slide to all of us. Thank you. Yeah. Can you see that? Yes, clearly. Okay, excellent. So, first of all, I'd like to congratulate the organisers on getting this telemedicine conference going in presence of coronavirus. And I think the excellent session yesterday where people who've been dealing with dialysis in coronavirus epicentres have given us advice on how to deal with it in our country. I think that was very helpful yesterday. So, I've been asked to talk, how do I practice the four hours for Australian patients? I've taken a very holistic approach and I've really looked at it 
as renal replacement rather than just dialysis. So first of all, the context, Australia, that's what I'm talking about. Um, Australia is a very wealthy country, as you know, and we have a very good Gini index. We've got low inequality. So our wealth is well divided across our population. We have an excellent public health system. And most importantly, and one of the themes of my talk, is we have a robust renal transplantation program. <clears throat> Finally, another factor is we've got an aging population. So when a patient's in, in end-stage renal failure, there are four management modalities available. Transplant is the best by far, and transplant is the cheapest, and that's what we should be aiming for. The others are peritoneal dialysis, hemodialysis, and medical management. And something I've been giving a lot more emphasis on is medical management. <clears throat> now, medical management of itself is not a long-term renal replacement therapy on its own. You can keep people alive with medical management for a while, but not in the long term. But one of the take-home messages about medical management is that medical management is not palliative care. In a lot of places where people talk about medical management, it's seen as abandoning the patient and allowing the patient to die. Whereas I see medical management as very much an active part of renal replacement therapy, an active arm. It should be given to everyone, and in many cases, it should be the primary treatment, especially with an aging population. So medical management is an active treatment delivered by dedicated clinics and ded dedicated specialists. And it must be emphasized to that patient. If a patient sees medical managers being abandoned by their doctor and no longer cared for, they won't want it. However, if it's offered to them as an active treatment and the best treatment in their situation, they will take it up. So as I say, it can be effective in the short and medium term. And in the sick and elderly population, it is often the best outcome. As, as a lot of you may know, there's actually a French study which compared medical management to dialysis in the sick and elderly, and they found that, that people with medical management lived longer and better than those given dialysis. So what I've found over the last 10, 20 years doing um, dialysis uh, renal replacement therapy in Australia is that the situation in our country has changed dramatically. And really, our renal replacement therapy population has split up into two groups. First of all, there are the young, the healthy, those with good life expectancy, those with good renal failure, like polycystic kidney disease or IgA, who are otherwise healthy people. That's group one. And then there's group two, the old, the sick, the comorbid, those with short life expectancy. And they've got bad renal failure diabetes, SLE, diseases that affect many other systems in their body. And how to do renal replacement therapy in those two groups is very different and has become increasingly separated in our country over the last 10 years. These patients need to be managed quite differently. So group one, the young and the healthy, what are the guiding principles of renal replacement therapy? The first point is that you're going to be looking after these patients, or should I say, your team is going to be looking after these patients for years to decades. Some of these patients will be alive for 40 to 50 years on renal replacement of one sort or another, well, belong, well beyond the um, occupational endurance of a single specialist. Renal transplant is the mainstay of the management of these patients. If you have a patient at 15, whom you're gonna keep alive till 55 with renal replacement therapy, that's going to be done with renal transplantation. The third guiding principle in this young group is that because you need to keep them alive for so very long, you need to have all modalities of renal replacement therapy available to you, and you need to look after them. During their lifetime, they may have a transplant, more than one transplant, PD, HD, and medical management. <clears throat> These are figures from Australia. Renal transplants per annum in Australia between 2000 and 2018. 
In 2000, we transplanted 540 patients. In 2009, we transplanted 800. And then in the last 10 years, we've doubled the number of transplants we do in our country. So we've caused an enormous increase in the number of transplants in our country in the last 10 years. And that happened through cultural change. If you look at the deceased donors, our main source of transplants in Australia, from 2000 to 2018, we've doubled that number. So we're using many, many more deceased donor transplants than we did in the past. And this is projected out to 2025, where we'll be using close to 1,000 deceased donor transplants. And remember, this is happening in the presence of falling road fatalities. Our main source of kidneys is road deaths. Yet the number of road deaths in Australia in 1980 was 1,200, and in 2012 was 600. So we are receiving fewer and fewer deceased donor kidneys because there's fewer dead people, but we're using more and more of them. So in Australia now, we've got 1,500 people on the waiting list, and the average patient waits three years to get a kidney. In addition, graft survival rates have increased dramatically. The five-year survival rate of a graft in 75-79 was 36 or 63%, depending whether it was deceased, donor, or live-related. In the 2000-2004 in the year period, the five-year survival rate had gone up to 81% and 88%, a dramatic increase. So, in group one, transplantation means that a patient will receive a kidney within three years. The transplant will probably last 10 years or more, and the patient is likely to receive more than one transplant. Therefore, in that group of patients, hemodialysis and PD play a bridging role only. Hemodialysis is short term. The fistulas in these young patients are relatively easy to make and are often ligated after first transplant. And they may have a second fistula because they've got good venous real estate. The main thing in this group is to avoid vas cats and avoid destroying the central veins. Peritoneal dialysis is also important in this group, but again, it's used as a bridge between transplants or a bridge until a functional fissure can be established. One of the ways of avoiding vas cats is to use the quick start selling a PD technique, which we've introduced to our unit. So just to compare the result of that, Australia and Malaysia have similar population Malaysia is now a developed country, but look at the number of people on the transplant list. We have 1,500. Malaysia has over 22,000 people on the waiting list. Why? We transplant over 800 a year in Malaysia 80. So the first take home message, how do I get the right access to the right patient at the right time for the right reason? Answer, fix your renal transplant program. Australia and Europe have succeeded in doing that, and you can too. We changed our culture and have a successful transplant program. You can all change your culture as well and obtain more kidneys. The second group is the old and sick, and that's the growing group in our population. The guiding principles of renal replacement therapy in the old and sick is that you have to do renal replacement therapy that's appropriate to the life expectancy of those people. And I think that's one of the biggest problems in the developing world. Renal replacement therapy has to be appropriate to their comorbidities and it's got to be appropriate to the patient options available. Medical management only, if the quality of life of the patient is poor. If the patient tells me that their quality of life before dialysis is started, is bad or dreadful, it is going to be no better on dialysis. It's going to be a lot worse, and they probably shouldn't start dialysis. If their life expectancy is six months, or they've got multiple severe comorbidities, a large section of the population referred to us now, treat them medically. Now, some patients and some families insist on active management when it's not appropriate, or sometimes you're not certain how long a patient is going to last. In that group, I believe that VASCAT hemodialysis is appropriate. It's a sort of a suck it and see policy. Give the patient VASCAT hemodialysis and see how they go. 
And if they find it's too rigorous, they switch to medical management. If it's a success, you create a fistula. Hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis in group two. The decision making depends on three things. The first, the most obvious, what is medically possible? The second is what is socially possible? And the third is what's the patient's preference? In that order. PD contraindications, severe peritoneal membrane damage, membrane failure, or large irreparable hernia. Medical contraindications to hemodialysis is inadequate cardiac reserve, inadequate arterial reserve, steel, or inadequate skin integrity. The fourth one is the least important. It's used all over the world as an excuse for not making a fistula. There's no suitable veins. But if you have surgeons trained in making fistulas under all circumstance, that's really the reason for not using hemodialysis. In terms of social reasons, for peritoneal dialysis being a home dialysis policy, the patient needs suitable hands and eyes so they can actually do their dialysis. So severe arthritis, blindness as in with diabetes are all contraindications. The patient needs to have the cognition to understand how to do it and what's implied, and they need the so social support. Also, they need a su suitable home environment. For hemodialysis, you need an available dialysis center or the ability to do home dialysis center. Patient care of preference is one of the biggest stumbling blocks in this elderly group. Patients often demand this or that when it's not medically suitable or when it's not in their best interests. And I think the attending physicians, the nephrologists and the access surgeons should be more directive in guiding the patients into what is best for them. So this is an example of a patient I was shown, 55-year-old diabetic, presented with an end-stage renal failure, vas cath placed, and a brachycephalic fistula created. Now he's got an ischemic hand. The question is, Dr. Swinnon, should we do a drill procedure? How do we treat steel in this fistula arm? The answer is, this is not a fistula problem. This patient should never have been offered dialysis via hemo. He should have been given peritoneal dialysis. His problem is now that he's got end-stage renal failure, he's got an ischemic arm, and he's got no proper renal replacement therapy. And here's another example, but a worse outcome. This patient's come in with renal failure, He's now got renal failure, an amputated arm, and no access. This should have been treated with peritoneal dialysis. Thank you for your attention. Well, thank you, Sweeney. Uh, so next we are moving to the experience <coughs> from the United States, and then we'll go for a discussion on all the talks. For the next speaker, let's welcome Dr. Engineer Davidson from United States, sharing about how does he practice for hours for American patients who need dialysis. Everybody, I'm Ingemar Davidson from Dallas and the great state of Texas. I will divide my presentation in three parts. First, I will give you a perspective of how this phrase, doing the right thing, came about in the dialysis field. Second, I will share with you a snapshot from my own experience of applying this concept into my own professional life with dialysis access. Finally, I will conclude this concept of doing the right thing in an editorial type summary. In the beginning of my career, there was no dialysis and no kidney transplants available. Everybody with kidney failure or ESRD died usually a very painful death of cerebral vascular nature from hypertensive complications associated with kidney failure. Fast forward to 2007, we published this review in Dialysis Access with a patient-centered approach to dialysis. One editorial advice to you who are younger in the audience than me is to include the powerful people around you and when you publish this is not only increasing your impact of your writing but also protects you from much criticism. 
as you may be able to read, I included with their consent, of course, Dr. Maurizio Gallieni, who is still the editor of Journal of Vascular Access, and Dr. Dolmetsch, who runs the SIDA program with me. And finally, Dr. Saxena, who runs the peritoneal dialysis unit at Parkland Hospital in Dallas. In this article, Table 2, outlined on the left side in this image, seemed to catch much attention at the time. It is a mission statement for a dialysis access center designed to apply anywhere on the globe. The implications are that not any single access type or device can or must fit right for everybody, every town and everywhere. In fact, it varies depending on many factors. This is the core message of my talk. The concept of doing the right thing has stand the test of time. Forward from 2007 to 2012, Dr. Charmaine Locke of Toronto, Canada and I wrote these follow-up papers reflecting the mission statement published now in seminars in nephrology. Dr. Locke, as everyone in this audience know, is the chairperson of the new DOKI 2019 KDOKI guidelines. And the new spirit of the DOKI guidelines concurs with the doing the right thing for everybody at all times. This is a slide from Dr. Locke's talk last year at the DAISY meeting in Singapore, as well as the CEDA meeting in San Diego last October. I'm sure you have seen this image minutes ago during Dr. Locke's presentation of the new DOKI guidelines. In fact, the fistula first and the distal first concepts are no longer at the forefront of dialysis access DOKI guidelines. This message of one size fits all is no longer valid. Each patient needs individualized attention. I will in the next few slides explore the various situations out there using an altitude or metaphor. In this case is an operator who only performs AV fistulas for various reasons. From the aviation metaphor, he or she has not even left the airport. This scenario represents very limited options for the patient. To give you a global view of dialysis access, and let's elevate ourselves so that we can see the big picture of delivering dialysis access applied worldwide. In this scenario, at the birds level, the access options now include catheters and grafts, but not peritoneal dialysis. There is a subliminal and unacceptable separation between PD and hemodialysis in many places in the world, which in fact deprives our patients from the most appropriate first-time dialysis mode in 50% of cases. A reason not to include PD is sometimes said as, I am a vascular surgeon, I don't do PD. The next level of access program includes peritoneal dialysis. This scenario is often associated with a transplant program. On the next altitude level, we can see the entire city where all access procedures are done in a coordinated fashion, including transplantation. If we decide to fly even higher at 60,000 feet at a supersonic speed, this image paraphrases the national level of ESRD and dialysis access planning. Again, now including disease prevention measures and transplantation. National planning and decision making are in principle not different from local planning, only more so in terms of impact and consequences for many individuals. The DOKI guidelines is an example of the level of altitude metaphoric national planning. This image of the burning Concorde aircraft on takeoff from the Orly airport in Paris is a stark reminder that even the best and most sophisticated designed healthcare system can fail when human errors intercept and rules are not followed. Can we fly even higher? Yes, indeed we can. The International Space Station, abbreviated ISS, symbolizes 
the global approach to ESRD. As the ISS is an amazing technical achievement, there is ample evidence it has contributed to world peace by the requiring of trust and cooperation between the world's leading powers to achieve this mission in space. Clearly, the ESRD healthcare global community could do something similar, not even having to leave the airport. This is a somewhat heavy loaded slide. It summarizes what modern or perhaps better and effective ESRD program could look like. This table outlines my thinking about the algorithmic selection of most optimal or the right renal replacement therapy. The subliminal message of this tabulation also is that ignoring transplantation, PD or grafts exclude up to 50% of your ESRD patients from the best or right renal replacement options. First, as medical professionals, our role is to prevent disease to happen in the first place. Obviously, we need an understanding patient or patient population, which is not a reality in most world societies. The patient responsibilities in prevention of kidney disease is a subject for another meeting session. After all, the kidney is the best dialysis machine. Few patients, or less than 3% in the US, qualify for a transplant per year for lack of acceptance criteria and lack of available organs. There are several compelling reasons to make peritoneal dialysis the most appropriate first-time dialysis modality in select patients, even in the case of excellent vascular mapping results. Patients who disqualify for PD should get an AV fistula when vascular mapping confirms suitable vascular anatomy. Then in this algorithm, grafts come in with various strong benefits. For example, with the early cannulation grafts, central vein catheter contact time can be cut short or even eliminated. Grafts also are suitable in the elderly patients using the upper arm where not only vessels are larger but also associated with lower risk for steel or hand ischemia. You might even consider proximal arterial inflow or PI in the elderly and comorbid patients to avoid steel and the use of central venous catheters. Finally, many patients with ESRD are in the end stage of life when a central vein catheter is the right dialysis access or perhaps even more often no access is the right option for your fellow human being. This central algorithm follows what would be reasonable to consider when all options and support systems are in place. There are of course gray areas between these choices including patient specific wishes. One serious fact is on the global scale Treatment with dialysis or a kidney transplant to stay alive may only be available to about 10% of the people who need this treatment to live. This table supports the use of grafts in the elderly as longevity is limited. For example, a 75-year-old individual on dialysis has less than three years to live compared to 10 years for the rest of us and seven years for transplanted patients, a fact that should guide us in the selection or treatment options from a quality of life perspective. My second part of my presentation is to show that this approach works in real life. The next few slides summarizes one of the dialysis access activities at UT Dallas, Texas. Back in those days, the transplant surgeon did the dialysis access by default. No one else wanted to do it. So this year, 2012, is the statistics with no exclusions in 393 patients. You will notice at the top line, we placed PD catheters in 33% of the patients. 
This compares to 8% in the US as a whole. Of the rest, 67% who was having a hemodialysis access, 65% had a native vein AV fistula. Even a fistula first proponent would be proud of this statistics. In 35% of patients, we placed a graft. I must mention that we have a very active, dedicated transplant center with an excellent PD and hemodialysis clinic and nurse coordinators dedicated to the best possible patient care. Patient survival was excellent in the upper 90th percentile for PD, grafts, and fistulas. This picture depicts the intervention-free access survival for 12 months. As you can expect, based on the selection criteria, PD patients do better at 91%, followed by AV fistulas and grafts with 80 and 67% respectively. Here is the secondary patency or excess function at one year, again above 90% for PD. However, grafts and AV fistulas were now similar or overlapping because grafts are technically easier to declot than native veins. This is in part also due to our excellent service from interventional radiology on campus. One lesson we learned was not to follow dogma and public guidelines. From this graph, you can see that I placed too many radiocephalic AV fistulas, at least based on the outcome with 65% function at 12 months, compared to 86 and 87% for upper arm basilic vein and brachiocephalic fistulas respectively. We have since moved more proximal following the suggestion I made in my algorithmic outline a few minutes ago. Here is another argument to rethink the dialysis access algorithm and fistula first concept. In this paper by Al Balas, the overall cost of AV fistulas over grafts was about 4,000 US dollars or even more or $10,000 in a single center study by Dr. Desai of Chicago, mainly by using early cannulation grafts and eliminating the use of central vein catheters. If the catheter use in the US would decrease from currently 80% at initiation to 20%, a society savings of 200 million would result. Similarly, if PD rate would increase from 8%, which is our current level in the US, to 30%, which is what we did in Dallas, a saving of 2 billion would be possible in the US. Along this thought, the prevalent PD rate in Hong Kong is 73%, suggesting that PD is indeed a viable option. PD as the first dialysis modality, which is not only the right thing to do, but it improves quality of life and it saves society much money. So how do we make everybody do the right thing? How do we have a dialysis access community that follows the patient-centered mission statement? Here are some challenging lists the ESRD population is growing with increasing disease burden as well as in complexity. Patients are older and sicker. The treatment team usually consists of several medical specialties delivering dialysis access. We are transplant surgeons or vascular surgeons, interventionalists, each of us with different training background and expertise. So not surprisingly, we have different ideas about the best solution for the same patients. New ideas and technical innovations are coming quickly and it is a challenge for the treatment team to learn how and when to use these new devices. The latest addition is the use of percutaneous endovascular placement of native AV fistulas. There are differences across the world in ESRD. For instance, a great variation in the incidence of disease, cultural ideas about renal replacement therapy, and what resources and technology are available. My editorial message is that the best answer is training and collaboration is the unifying force in the fragmented dialysis access world. To deeply understand 
these concepts. Reading Steve Covey's book, The Seven Habits for Highly Effective People, will address and answer most of these philosophical questions. This Congress, or DACI, turned electronic, or virtual if you like, a reminder to us of our external vulnerability. But also, it can teach us, perhaps, how we can redirect the way we train and teach. To this end, I'd like to bring your attention to an online training platform that we are developing, orchidneyacademy.com. Many groups shown on this slide offer training in dialysis access. Here are examples of societies and meetings that offer opportunities to bring colleagues together to learn concepts and skills through interactive discussions and simulations. Please notice that we put DAISY on top of the gang. Technology now allows information to be shared quickly. On this slide I also have some examples of digital resources on topics relevant to dialysis access. The project I'm involved with is, again, kidneyacademy.com. Kidney Academy is a not-for-profit education and collaboration resource that is being built right now. This is a list of 15 CME modules that we will be offering that make up a foundation of dialysis access education and training. Please visit the website often to learn more about this evolving online resource. Here we have much to learn from the unprecedented aviation progress and the use of simulation as part of pilot training. Just one example from placing PD catheters using simulation in a live pig model. Most things we can do in dialysis access can be simulated as listed on your left side of this image. In this case, I am showing an example of a very realistic simulation training in placing PD catheters using laparoscopic techniques in a live pig model. At this point, we have trained five surgeons in all possible technical details, and the pig is still doing very well with a catheter carotid abdomen. I'm truly sorry that we didn't make it to Taipei this morning. As we start traveling again, I'd like to welcome you all to the CEDA conference in Salt Lake City October 28th through 30 later this year. Thank you, and I wish you the best for the DACI electronic meeting, and have a great day. Thank you, Davison, about your talk. I, it, apparently, there are differences among different countries. Uh, now I invite all the faculties for online discussion, and uh, Edward Chok. We have a new commentator join uh, from Singapore. So may you be the first one to comment on the talks we've heard about different countries, different experience, how they improve their clinical care. In the situation yeah, hi. in Singapore. Um, uh, thanks, uh, Pujin. Um, yeah, uh, so I'm Edward Chok from Singapore. Uh, just like to congratulate you, first of all, for an excellent uh, program, despite the challenges, and also to all the speakers uh, this morning, I really enjoyed the talks. Um, I think it is clear uh, that uh, there's still so much to do in terms of improving our uh, clinical care for our own dialysis access patients. Um, and I've got a question, I suppose, to since I've got speakers from all over the world. I think what Jackie has shown is that in her study in NUH, that uh, if you collect data, and then you analyze your data, you can very much improve on the care provided for the excess patients. So, for example, in all other, other areas of uh, um, uh, uh, vascular surgery, we've got uh, uh, initiatives uh, to improve care, for example, in aortic surgery, carotids and lower limbs. We collect prosthetic data and then we then analyze and see how we can improve things. I just wondered, whether there's a similar thing in other countries where you uh, have, a, uh, for example, a, a dialysis access initiative where you collect prospective data, you see how long your access needs to mature and how many of these goes through balloon, balloon assisted maturation to be used as a carrot rather than a, a stick to improve uh, uh, access. 
I know in Singapore it hasn't. So perhaps maybe I can encourage uh, Jackie to lead a nationwide initiative in collecting a prospective database where we can all contribute from all the six to seven uh, uh, major uh, public hospitals. Yeah, thank you, Edward. Uh, so regarding the, what you have said, I think it is very important to collect data, clinical data is very important, uh, such as in Taiwan, actually we do monitor the, uh, every parameter is in almost every specialties, although not everybody doing their perspective thing. Uh, but however, you know what you have done, then you can improve. Then prospective study for academic, in addition, uh, those uh, academic results may be uh, applied to our clinical practice in the future. So our commentators, any comment and questions, uh, Sweeney? Yep. Can people hear me? Yes. Yes, yeah. um, I wanted to comment on what you just said and what Jackie said about collecting data and following fissure maturation. Uh, we've got a very active renal replacement therapy program. We've got a very well organized re um, uh, transplant program, yet it's an extremely complex system. We've got this constant stream of elderly sick patients from different cultures with variable social um, support systems coming to our hospital with vascaths or failing kidneys, needing fistulas, and keeping track of all these changes from PD to hemo, transplant program, multiple specialists, it's a huge job. I mean, in Australia, we're pretty organized and pretty disciplined. We've got lots of money and we struggle with it. And I hear from Jackie, who comes from also a very organized discipline society, Singapore, that they're also struggling with it. It's actually an extremely complex situation requiring a huge amount of data to make this work properly and sort it out. I don't think it's a simple thing. It's not simple, but we have to do it as well. And um, from all of your talks, especially from John, your talk, and from a talk from Davison, actually, uh, there are some differences I've heard. Renal transplantation is important. Peritoneal dialysis is one of the important uh, therapy as well. But however, in Taiwan, that is not popular at all. And John Sweeney have mentioned change the culture is important. Uh, yeah. For example, in Taiwan last year, we, we have 23 million population. Uh, the transplantation do donor here last year was like 300. That's the, the highest in recent years. And the previous years, almost around 100 or 200 per year. So how do you, how do you guys, you can improve the transplantation or, do, or change the culture? How to do it in the United States or in Australia or in, even in Canada? Yeah, look, if I can answer that. Um, for many years, I went, I've been going around Southeast Asia and people tell me, Dr. Swinnon, we can't transplant here, it's cultural. And I accepted that. And in Australia, between 2000 and 2010, we were trying to improve our transplant rates and it didn't work. Our transplant range in Australia between 2000 and 2010 was stuck and it didn't move. And although I'm not a transplant surgeon, I work a lot with the transplant team, Jeremy Chapman, etc. And then suddenly in 2010 in Australia, but also in many European countries, our transplantation numbers exploded and it's gone up enormously, doubled even more. And it's a cultural change. And the cultural change was ultimately this. What was happening in our countries where we depend largely on deceased donor donations, um, injured people would go to ICU, usually road trauma, young people, and the ICU people would look after them. And at the last moment, the renal physicians would come in as the patient was dying and they would ask the family, can we have his kidneys? And the, the family would, of course, say to the renal physician, you're a vulture, go away. You're not touching my son or my daughter. And the culture was changed that the responsibility for speaking to the family and harvesting organs from deceased patients was passed from the nephrologists 
onto the ICU teams. So it became the responsibility of ICU and the anesthetists and the intensivists to liaise with the patient's family from the word go and to introduce the concept early so that people requesting the kidneys and not the nephrologists coming in at the last moment like vultures harvesting the organs, but it was the doctors who'd been looking after that dying patient for the last two weeks or two months, whatever, who'd formed a relationship with the family asking, we can't save the patient, but can we have their kidneys? And that enormously changed the donation rate. That's a cultural change that's been affected in Spain, in Belgium, in Europe, in Australia. That cultural change has enormously increased kidney donation and has had a huge impact on the patients we look after, patients with end-stage renal failure. And then I'm told in Malaysia and I'm told in Singapore, we can't change our culture. Why not? In Europe and Australia, we've changed our culture. You need to address those things that are stopping your population from donating kidneys. Well, thank you. So any comment from other faculties? Yes, Shaman Lok. Oh, can you hear me? Yes, clearly. Okay. Uh, so I want to congratulate the speak any of them, including Dr. Sweeney. I uh, really embodied um, in their talk the, the life plan and transplant and PD and so on and so forth. But I just want to comment about the culture. So I live in Toronto and it's very multicultural. And it is, it's not just the culture, but there's also religion that needs to be considered when you try to get people into transplant. And that's one of the important things about the life plan is to talk to the patient very early on to see what their cultural and religious beliefs are um, so that you have that relationship so that we're not coming in as vultures, um, you know, that we have that communication with the ICU doctor even. So we were able to change the balance of, um, you know, increasing our transplant by trying to, we actually went out to find out why our transplantation rates were low. And the honest truth is, sometimes you can't change it because there is that very deep religious belief. In other cases, it's cultural and it, it takes a lot of work, but it's education. It's educating the patients with regards to, you know, the, the benefits of uh, transplantation. So I think, it's, I, I think it's very complex and I think every society and every country is different. So while something may work in Australia, it may or may not work in, in Singapore just because it's not just the culture, but the, the religion and how information is disseminated. And I, and I think that it will take a long time to move everybody in that direction, but I think it can happen by examining your own culture and your own country. And I do believe if everybody thinks about the life plan to think, and I do believe transplant is excellent. It is the best, you know, kidney replacement therapy that if we talk to people about it and educate them that it can be included in everybody's life plan. Thank you, Sharman, for your uh, reminders for the important things. The religion is important. Education is important. Um, Miata, we'd like to hear a comment from you. Yeah. Uh, Japan is a really uh, developing country in far as the, the uh, brain death transplant. And, uh, but uh, we, uh, young people, has now changing their, their ideas. For example, in our uh, prefecture in Kumamoto, uh, the whole population have a different idea, uh, different ideas and, uh, for the brain death transplant, but they, uh, we had uh, the questionnaires uh, for the, uh, the, our uh, population, and then um, elder people does not agree. Uh, about w with this uh, brain death transplant in 70 person, but younger people, uh, the, actually, and the high school students, uh, 75 percent uh, of uh, uh, young people agree with this uh, um, uh, 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 brain death transplant. So that uh, as um, as as we mentioned here, the education is very, very important, and uh, it is quite difficult to uh, educate elderly people, but uh, we can do it for the younger people. 
and that's uh, that's our what now is happening in our in our country. Thank you. Thank you, Miata. So, any comment from other faculties or uh, NCLU? I see you raise your hand. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I'd like to make a comment about uh, uh, Jackie's uh, presentation. I'm quite impressed that if you do a preemptive fistula, at the end of the study, she found that more than 90% of this fistula can be used for dialysis. And I share the same uh, in, in belief that in countries like Asia, where we have smaller veins and smaller arteries, perhaps early fistula saves life. Because I know there are some studies say in the, from the published in the US that showed that if you were to do a preemptive fistula early, uh, actually in elder individuals, sometimes up to 30% of this fistula weren't utilized. So it's like a wasted fistula. However, in Asia, you find that when patients come late, they go on central venous catheter and etc. When you compare those wasted fistula versus the complication arising from central vein uh, occlusion, you find that it's it's cheaper to have wasted fistula than to manage those with central vein uh, venous occlusion. So I think uh, if Jackie remembers years ago, we actually talked about this that perhaps instead of fistula first in Asia, we should actually encourage early fistula creation, uh, especially in those uh, people who are young. I don't know if the rest of the audience, uh, especially those from Asia, uh, shares this uh, uh, same belief. Yes, for, for me personally, I, I absolutely support for the early referral and the early uh, construction of the AV fissure. Yes, uh, other faculty, Dr. Yan? Yes. Uh, I think the, the transplant is the best treatment for RRT, renal transplant for the end stage kidney. And uh, in Taiwan, I also in uh, the transplant team in, in, in my hospital. In our practice, the living transplant, I think the solution for the organ resource, because in our hospital, the 60% kidney transplant is the living living transplant from the source from the, the sister, brother, the, the parents. So the first way then the listing the, the patient on the waiting list is that it can improve the, the increase the number of transplant. And uh, the other thing is the, I, I think that, uh, and I'm talking about the uh, visa first, in the early time, I believe in the visa first because uh, no infection and uh, the patient is more better than the graft. But right now, I think I already, already a, a little changed the, the thinking because in, the, the, in Asia, many age person is a vascular condition is very poor. So, this kind of patient, if you do the every fistula, you need to many times bend and uh, bend, 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 many times bend. So, when this is this, this for the patient is very unhappy. So right now, for the vascular condition, this poor patient, I will ship to every G first because the every G first, the patient can get that on the dialysis very quick, very soon. This is my opinion. Exactly. So actually, fissure is not for everybody. Uh, not, uh, so, so that's why we're talking about the right access for the right people. Um, my dearest faculties, because of time constraint, I, we have to close the session. And I'm so glad to have this chance to discuss with you. And I believe in the future, in uh, today, we still have a lot of rooms to discuss other very important issue. Thank you all.